we're doing Owls of Southern Ontario today, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And who are we? Um, I'm Nikki, and I'm from the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust. I also have Aileen here with me in case my rural internet cuts out. We protect land across the Oak Ridges Marine. Um, and I just wanted to get started by doing a land acknowledgement. We always encourage everyone to be really mindful as we read these. We know you may have heard them before, but every single time you listen to the words, we really want you to think about what you're hearing. So we would like to start off by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Wandat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge the land we are on is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaties. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. We would also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation as our, our closest Indigenous community. We acknowledge this land and the people because the first step to reconciliation is recognizing the existence of Indigenous people. A shared understanding of how our collective past brought us to where we are today will help us walk together into a better future. We give deep gratitude to the Indigenous peoples of these lands who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. The Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. Thank you everyone. I just wanted to note that it's not only important for land conservation to really take a interest in this, but also everyone across Canada and North America. Now, what is the Oak Ridges Moraine? Um, you may not have heard too much about it. It is a geological feature that was created 13,000 years ago during the Ice Age and is covered in a unique habitat for species at risk, as well as being a source of fresh water, which is something Canada is known for. If you don't know much about where this feature is located, it actually stretches across um, east to west from uh, Northumberland area all the way to Peel. So it's quite a large narrow area. Here's some additional stats about the moraine, which include unique water habitats. Additionally, 90% of the moraine is actually under private ownership, which is sort of where we come in. The Trust is a registered charity with the goal of protecting natural environments forever. We currently have 60 properties protected under our management and we're always working to increase that coverage. Um, we work with mostly landowners, um, donors and, and things like that. So this is the map again. Uh, this time it shows areas where some of our properties are actually located. As you can see, we're not constrained uh, to the borders of the moraine. We also use different methods to protect land like conservation easements, purchases, and joint ownerships. Privately owned land is important to us and you, so we work with the Ecological Gifts Program to federally protect lands like that forever. Uh, this creates a significant tax benefit for landowners and it also protects biodiversity and environmental heritage. So it's sort of a win-win for us and landowners that we work with. We also do outreach education programs just like this webinar and we have a few um, opening up in the next few months. So these are upcoming free webinars, um, self-guided walks, Biolympics and more as we get into the warmer months. For example, we're looking at doing a Buzz About Bees webinar, which is pretty exciting. It sort of talks about what to do in your garden and identifying native bees. We actually have a confirmed salamanders and other slithery things webinar coming um, on March 23rd. We do backyard biolympics, which are at home activities that are really, really fun. We do bio, or bio blitzes on our properties as well. And we do visits to our nature reserve, which are sometimes guided walks, self-guided walks, things like that. All right, so I am done. I'm going to stop sharing and ha uh, hand it over to Nick. Okay, oh, and so you're on the share my screen. Yeah, but I just have to. Oh, okay. I stopped sharing. I think I'm good. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Share. And then we'll start at the beginning. Okay. All right, it's good. I'm going to mute myself and if you need anything from me, um, like reading the chat or anything, I'll let you know, okay? Or you let me know. Yeah, so I don't have my screen set up where I can see the chats, so I'm not sure how to do that. So we That's might okay. have to wait I'll... for questions at the end. 
Um, so my name is Anik. I work at the Owl Foundation. And so what a great way to start is to thank, um, you know, our, the original people that, uh, you know, cultured this land and uh, honored it. Um, so now we're going to talk about nature. So first, um, I'm actually going to stop uh, my video, uh, the screen sharing and block the slideshow. Can anybody tell me? I don't know how that would work. Are you trying to stop screen sharing so you can just see your video? Yeah, like I don't know if my little uh, camera where you can see me is blocking any images. Depends how they're viewing it, the way that I'm viewing or is it, it off to the side. I think it's usually off to the corner. It doesn't block? Not okay, too much. So I just don't want any slide. Yes. Um, everyone says okay. that. So, anyways, who we are? Um, and we. Oh, oh, I see the more. Here we go. Can I see the chat screen? Not blocking my view. Voice is breaking up sometimes. Screen looks good. Okay. So, unfortunately, we have rural internet. So, um, there may be some breaks. Um, so hopefully, you can still get the right message. Um, so. Um, our goals, of course, is to return back to the wild, but while they're here, provide good nutrition, um, appropriate housing, appropriate medical care, uh, and reduce the stress while they're there. Um, and we also network with a lot of rehab centers across Ontario and to educate the public like we're doing today. Oh, I think I'm, here we go. Um, so we're registered charity. Um, we, uh, in order to do what we do, we have to have permits. And so we work with the Ministry of Natural Resources for that permitting process. Um, but we're not open to the public. Um, so um, it, it helps keep the stress levels down for our bird. Uh, we have a site care we can do um, in Toronto and Guelph, uh, as well as locally, um, to help us care for our birds. So what is rehabilitation? Um, it's to return to good health and to working order. Um, so when you're talking about wildlife is that it's very important that we're not just working with the physical aspect of uh, returning them to full health, but also the mental. We wanna make sure that they're also fit for, for returning back to a normal lifestyle, to be able to hunt and find their own food, to be able to fly successfully and avoid predation uh, and dangerous situations. But we also don't wanna tame them or habituate them. And that same goes with orphan wildlife. So orphan wildlife, we want to make sure that they're raised by their own kind. Um, the first steps, of course, is always to try to reunite them with their original um, families. But if that's not possible, um, then we have to make sure that they know how to hunt and fly correctly. So now we get to the nitty gritty. So you're here today to learn about owls. Um, and so we're going to go through a variety of different subjects. Um, but first, the owl basics. What <laughs> does an owl look like? So they all have very sharp curved beaks. Um, they have these beautiful sharp talons for uh, grasping their prey. And they have the forward facing eyes. So the, most other birds have the eyes on the side. These guys have them forward facing, which I think that's probably why many people find them so um, adorable because they kind of give that cute, adorable impression of a young animal. So they're all carnivores. Um, so they all um, uh, eat animals of a, a variety of different types. So insects, snakes, rodents, birds, small animals. It all depends on the animal size, what they're going to target for their, for their menu. Um, so they're all active mainly uh, in the evenings, but we do have some owls that are active um, during the day, but most of them prefer a nocturnal or a, a crepuscular um, type of activity. So that's a dusk and dawn. Um, but diurnals um, is what you would term something that's active during the day. So this time of year, you may see more activity of owls during the day, just because during the winter months, the prey density is a little bit more challenging and there's more competition. So our owl species may be actually, you know, out and about during daylight hours because of hunger and not necessarily because that's their normal pattern of activity. Um, and so that's uh, dusk and dawn is crepuscular. So what do they do? Well, they hunt a, a variety of ways. So they can either hunt on the wing, they can perch and stoop, or they can hover over a field. And again, it's species specific as to what their preference is. Doesn't mean that they would take one or the other, um, but they do have uh, habits just like we do. 
um, they blend very well in their um, environment. And I think that's why a lot of people struggle with finding them um, because their plumage is specifically designed to be hidden. Um, and you also have to remember, especially for the smaller owls, that they also have to be worried about being preyed upon. So we have two screech owl images that are, you know, on the right side of your screen uh, and they're popping out of a cavity. And then you have actually uh, two short-eared owls hiding in that image. So you can imagine if you're walking in nature, how you could easily walk past them and not even see them. So they all make really cool sounds. Uh, one of the common um, mistakes people make is that uh, they think that they all hoot, but they don't. So the great horned owl has, I think, what I would concern, could consider the most common owl sound. So the sounds are a little harder to hear. So I'm going to stop talking. So hopefully you heard that. So that's a great horned owl. But they don't all hoot. We have the screech owl. That's more like a trilling sound. We have the sawwet owl. We have the short-eared owl that has more of a scream. And then my favorite that throws everyone off is the lovely hawk owl. Cool things they can do. They fly silently. Um, the flight, uh, the silent flight comes from the adaptations of their feathers. Their feathers actually have ridges on the leading edge so that as they're flying through the air, um, it cuts the wind turbulence down. Um, and also um, the vein of the feathers have a, like a light pile, like a fuzz, so that as they're sliding across each other, they make less sound. Um, and they actually are considered to be one of the softer feathers in the feather world. Um, if you were ever had an opportunity to feel an owl feather, they're quite soft and they're very flexible as well. They're not very stiff. And there, there's a range in how silent they fly depending on the species. There's some that are really quiet and there's some that you can hear a little bit. They're, the most common thing people know about owls is how flexible their heads are. Um, and so you have an image on the left of a two juvenile horned owls. And if you notice that the one on the left actually has his back facing us, and he's turned his head around and the one on the right is actually facing forward. Then we have a, a foster mom with a juvenile and so she's looking behind her and she can actually even turn a little bit further and she could even go another 15 to 20 degrees further to the right. So this is the common range uh, of motion that they can do with their necks. Um, some of it is just because they have a ball and socket joint on uh, as, the, as the last vertebra connection. Um, and uh, I'm seeing a lot of little chats. I'm just going to take a moment. Oh, okay. So that's great. Okay. I just want to make sure there wasn't an issue. Um, so they have very flexible necks. So part of it is because the ball and joint socket, just like your shoulder, can be very flexible. But it's also because they actually have very long necks, but it's all hidden by feathers. So like when you look at an image of an owl, it looks like they have no neck at all, but they keep it in an S curve. Um, but they actually do quite have long ver neck vertebra. So another thing that people seem to recall about owls is that they cast pellets. And so for those of you who don't know what a pellet is, pellet is actually um, food that they've consumed in chunks or whole, and it's the material that they can't pass through the intestines. So it stops at the stomach um, in the proventriculus and it kind of compacts it up into a ball. And just like if you have a cat, it's the same kind of principle. They compact it into a little ball and they um, hack it back up. Um, and so I actually do have an example here, but I can't see my, I hadn't share my video yet, but we'll do that after. Um, so the, um, 
the uh, pictures on the right is just them on the ground. So again, easily missed, but it's a great way to see where the birds are roosting. So when you do go on a nature hike, check uh, underneath the trees uh, for um, what they call whitewash, um, white urates, um, which is basically their pea, um, or casted pellets. The fecal material would be a little harder to see because it would blend in with the ground. Uh, and so this is the things that you can actually pull out of a pellet. And it's very useful for scientists to determine what they're actually eating uh, primarily so that they know what habitats to preserve uh, if there is an endangered species. So this is just an example of a snowy owl hacking up a pellet. And the, the process takes about 12 to 24 hours after a consuming a meal. So they can also see in very low light conditions. So they can't see in the very pitch black room if there's no light source, um, but they can see a much better than we could in low level lighting. And it's because their eyes are tubular. Um, it allows for more light to hit the back of the retina where they actually you know, receive the, the vision. Um, they can also detect sound from very, very far away. So you can see two owls in the image below um, with the feathers protruding up on the head. That's actually not their ears, but that's part of their uh, anatomy description, they call them tufts, ear tufts, but they're actually not their ears. Um, their ears are actually on the sides of their head, um, so right beside their eyes, um, kitty quarter to their mouth. Um, and so depending on the species, you'll have a small ear opening like in the screech owl or a very pronounced ear opening like the short eared. So you can kind of guess just based on those ear openings what their specialty is. Do they like to look for their prey or do they like to listen for their prey? Are they hunting on the wing? So they want to be able to detect sound as they're up high and they're, they're, there's wind turbulence and feather rustling going on. Um, so do they need to pinpoint that more accurately? And so they have uh, more pronounced ear openings and the skin and the feathers actually sense the vibrations of the sound and direct it to the ear. Um, some species have gone so far as to actually adapt the skull to allow for better pinpointing of sound. Um, so this is actually a, a, a boreal owl skull, and uh, the boreal and the sawwet have those bony adaptions, um, and that helps them detect sound um, horizontally and vertically and pinpoint it with, you know, fin finite accuracy, like it's amazing how accurate they can be. Um, so they live in all continents except Arctic and Antar Antarctic poles. Um, they live in a variety of different habitats. Um, but when it comes to nesting, they're a little on the lazy side, so they don't actually build their own nests. They utilize existing nests or structures, so tree snags, rock ledges, artificial nests, um, and uh, so they don't do a lot of maintenance, um, and they don't create their own, so they steal other people's nests. So squirrel dr uh, drays sometimes are utilized. Um, so parental, they're very, very good parents. Um, so their babies are born helpless, so um, a lot of parental care is needed. Um, so a term is called altricial. Um, so they actually, um, you know, lay an egg that, uh, you know, a cute little fuzzy, very minimally feathered bird comes out of the egg. Uh, and so it's very important that mom keeps them warm. Um, so she has to provide shelter and food for her, her little nestling. Um, and then dad will provide meals for the mom. Uh, and as the baby's uh, develop and get older, um, they can actually be fed directly by dad. Um, but both parents are very protective of the nest, and so both can, um, you know, uh, be defenders of a nesting site. So we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty of each bird species, but first, uh, species classification. Um, so we're all classified, even we are. Um, so we're all part of the kingdom Animalia, um, we are all part of the phylum chordata, which is uh, uh, basically we have a solid backbone. Um, but for us, we're part of the mammals, um, the class of mammalia. Um, and then for owls, they're part of aves. Uh, and then you break it down to families and genuses and species. Um, and so um, the reason why I kind of brought this to your attention, because the next slide, we're going to actually break it down into um, family groups. Um, as well as in genus, so that you can see which owls are actually closely related to each other. Um, so we only have uh, in North America one Tito uh, in the family Tito, and that is the barn owl. Um, and the rest are in the strigid groupings. Um, when you look at, um, if you go back to this slide, uh, when you look at Strigidae and Titonidae, 
Um, so now we're broken down to genus. So in, in, uh, in the Tidos, um, oh, actually I should have had this genus. Oh my goodness, I'm a bad biologist. These are supposed to be genuses. Um, so we have the barn owl. Um, we have in the Igliolis, uh, we have the boreal and the northern sawwet. So they're actually closely related, um, but they do behave differently. And we're gonna um, go into detail with the sawwet, um, but the boreal is not within the range of the southern birds. Um, but just for an example, the sawwet is uh, a migratory species, whereas the boreal owl is not, it's actually a sedentary species. Um, then we have the long-eared owls. We have um, a, a closely related, uh, the short-eared owl. So um, not very ch a challenge with naming, right? So the tufts on the head is basically indicating that their names uh, for the long ear, they have the very long ear tufts and then the short ear have very, very small. You can't see it in the image, but they do have these really tiny little feather protrusions on top. Again, closely related, they're in the same genus, but um, behave completely different. Um, short-eared owls are ground nesters, long-eared owls are um, up in the trees. Um, they both have communal roosting behavior in the winter time. Um, so there is a bit of similarities um, and their food sources are, are, are roughly the same, but their habitats are slightly different. Um, then we have in the Bubu genus, we have the great horned owl and the snowy owl. Now snowy actually used to be in its own separate genus, but they recognize that they actually are really closely related. Um, so they actually changed their genus status probably I think about 10 years ago, maybe even 15. Um, so now they're in the same genus. And then we have the screech owl all by himself in the megascops. And we'll talk further about their wonderful color plumages. And then in the Strix a genus, we have the barred owl and the gray gray. Um, this is a slide that I actually tucked in recently. So that's why I made that error about the family versus genus. Um, so then we have the hawk owl. And, uh, and so they're in their own uh, genus as well. So that just gives you a rough idea. So now we have this wonderful image that gives you a bit of an idea um, sizing um, references too. So we do have, when we go into each species, we do have a little title that says large, medium, small, but this just gives you a bit of an idea um, size references. But when you look at uh, some of these birds and they look like they're closely in, closer in size, and then uh, you also have to consider weight. So the great gray, even though he's quite large, the snowy owl actually beats him by at least 700 grams when it talk about body weight. Um, so great grays are very tall and skinny, whereas snowy owls are very robust birds. Um, and again, their prey choices are different. Uh, great grays, even though they're very large, prefer a small prey base, um, a small animals, whereas a snowy will take a ptarmigan, um, a large ducks, birds, seagulls, rabbits, um, whereas a gray gray, uh, you'd be hard pressed to get convince them to take on that uh, critter. So Southern Ontario, we just have a little map just so you know um, where commonly these birds are gonna be found. Um, and so the common owls that you'll see in these areas, um, the screech owl, the great horned owl, the long-eared owl, the Northern sawwet owl, and the short-eared owl. Occasional sightings, you will get um, barred owls. Now for your region uh, in the Moraine, you probably will be more commonly seeing the barred owl than in Niagara region and in western, uh, south southwestern uh, Ontario. Um, but there's another slide I'm gonna show you um, that um, might make this a more frequent um, site for um, the southern region. And then we have the barn owl. It's a very small population um, and we'll discuss uh, a little bit further about their population numbers. Uh, and then we have the snowy owl and we'll discuss um, even further um, why they're occasional sightings and not a common uh, presence. So we're always learning, things are always changing, things are always adapting. Nature, um, one of the beautiful things about nature is that it's fluid and hopefully the stresses we put on our environment um, are going to help it change and adapt. And so with animal populations, a lot of their uh, movements and, and, and decisions on where they hunt, where they live, where they breed, where they populate are based on these environmental changes, whether it be a natural disaster or a change that we've created or weather pattern changes or prey density. These are all factors that help them decide where they're gonna live, how they're gonna live and, and how long they're gonna be there. 
Um, there's a wonderful site operated by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's called ebirds.org. And so if you're not familiar with it, it's something that it's great uh, if you're an amateur birder or um, take it a little more seriously. You do have to keep in mind that some of this data um, is not um, validated, but um, they do uh, try to follow up if it's an, a rare sighting. Um, they do try to follow up and to try to prove it with a picture. So if it's a rare sightings, they will try to follow up with that um, note. But a lot of these are done by uh, people reporting these sightings. Um, but it's a great resource and fun to look at and fun to research it. So I decided to use the barred owl as an example. Um, so the barred owl, since 1900s to about 2010, the purple with the density changes actually represent um, uh, sightings, uh, reported sightings. So you can see for our southern region, it actually um, isn't well represented um, in our southern region, especially in the west of Ontario and in Niagara region. But when you look now, in the last 10 years, the sightings have significantly increased. Um, so we can extrapolate as to why a couple years ago we did have some massive forest fires and mixed forests up north that could have pushed a lot of these barred owls down. And then once they've established themselves down here, there, we do have some nice mixed forests that they can probably settle into. They're very adaptable species. Uh, but you can see that there is a lot more sightings year round in the past 10 years in more of a southern region and in um, western Ontario. But still in the summer months, there is still not as many sightings. Um, so what we have to then maybe consider is that some of the sightings that are happening um, during the fall and winter are displaced juveniles, dispersing juveniles trying to find their own space. Because usually what happens is when a parental unit, especially a sedentary species, kick their kids out of the nest, they have to find a new space. The adults get to keep the space. Uh, and so as they move, they may get confronted by other adults that are keeping their space. And so they have to keep going further and further and further until they can establish their own territories. So that was just a nice point. So now we're going to go piece by piece into some of the, the species that are commonly found. Um, so again, we're not going to discuss northern species like the great gray, the boreal owl, um, and the hawk owl, but we will talk about some of the ones that are more common. So first we're going to listen to some sounds. So I'm going to stop talking because the sounds are really, you know, a, a key point that not many people have an opportunity to hear. So we're going to do a territorial trill. Hopefully you can hear that. It's very light. We'll do a little whinny. And then the, the name for their, their name is Screech. So the Screech is usually an alarm distress call that we see. So you can see from the left-hand side, they come in a variety of colors. So uh, the most predominant uh, obvious color changes um, are the red morphology and the gray morphology, but you can have an in-between brown morphology. Um, what's interesting is that the red is actually a dominant color and the gray is actually recessive. And a lot of people say, well, how's that possi possible? But if you look at all the blue-eyed blonde people out in, in our environment, they are actually both a recessive gene, the blue eye, and the blonde hair are recessives, and we do have a, quite a bit of people that are blonde and blue eyes. Um, and so they do see a pattern where the red screech owls is more in a drier climate with a bit more mixed forest, whereas the, uh, the gray seems to be more um, uh, abundant in a more of a wetter area. So um, they are more dusk and dawn, um, and they are sedentary. So once they claim a space, um, they, they want to maintain it. So that's why, um, you know, it's encouraged to do, um, uh, when you do uh, decide to put an owl box in and they claim it, more often than not, you actually have a repeat uh, nesting. Um, they can have up to six eggs um, and they do mate for life. So they tend to have a strong monogamous bond uh, that they maintain throughout the, 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 the whole year. Um, and uh, woodland habitats, they can, they do really well in urban settings. They're all downtown Toronto. They don't need much space. They actually do well in urban settings because they also love to um, eat insects. And so a lot of the city lights attract moths and June bugs. Um, they will also um, frequent ponds. So they, they, they have been known to pick up frogs. Um, some have even been spotted fishing. So uh, you never know. So their breeding periods between March and May, um, cavity nest preferred. 
and as I mentioned, that they have a variety of small prey um, uh, items that they, they can go for. Um, and they hunt mainly from perches. So they do like to, to hide. Um, they're really well known for hugging against a tree and playing bark. Um, so, but just be aware that they actually do know you're there um, and it is a stressful situation. So keep your viewing to a minimum. And we're gonna talk a little bit of et about etiquettes near the end. Um, and like I said, do well in urban settings. So now we have the great horned owl. Um, so the great horned owl is another common species in our landscape, um, but they need a bit more space, um, but they do frequent in downtown Toronto in the golf, cart, the golf courses, as well as in the larger parks. Um, as well as any of the ravines um, and um, landscapes like that. Um, so we're going to hear um, their territorial call, which is the most common one that people may note. This is a call also that we hear when they're reconnecting as a partnership. They're using that call back and forth to each other as well as announcing it to other um, territories. And then the protest call is what I call when they're not very pleased. Um, so these guys are at dusk and dawn. That's where, and, and when we talk about activities, like I said, um, the, these activities can change depending on their needs and what's happening. Uh, if the prey density is low, you may see them more often in out of, of typical um, patterns. Um, but this is what their preferences are. Um, they're sedentary they're monogamous. So once you do have an established pair, um, they maintain that bond throughout the year. Um, they claim that territory, try to get any out, outsiders out of there. Um, and they have a broad range of habitats. They're not picky. Um, again, um, February, they're one of the, they, they are the earliest nesting species that we have in Ontario. Um, so an established pair can start as early as being in a nest in January if the weather is favorable and the prey density is, is, is good. Um, but typically we see them starting their nesting phase at the end of February and having their uh, eggs hatch around March. Um, so it gives these things, stags, squirrels, drays, so they're up in the trees. Um, often um, they actually share their space with red-tailed hawks. Um, sometimes they steal red-tailed hawks nests, so if you see a red-tailed hawk nest, you might actually see a horned owl in it right now. Um, and they have a variety of prey sources um, because they're a larger bird, they can take on larger um, animals and they hunt from perch ground and on the wing. So our long ears, um, here's uh, some breeding sounds. I know I see a lot of chats. Hopefully I'll be able to answer questions. in the end. Um, warning calls. I'm just going to quickly. Okay. And then warning call. And then their bark. Lost my cursor for a second. So as to when they're using these calls, it's, it's, it's hard to determine because they are very, very nervous species. So often um, our units for them are tucked away and they've got lots of uh, uh, evergreen trees to give them places to roost and hide. Um, they're a very nervous, nervous species in care. Um, we have to be very careful um, that they don't harm themselves because they are very, very nervous. We call them like the Cooper's hawk of the owl world. They have that same type of energy. I don't know if you've seen Cooper's hawks in action. <laughs> um, they are migratory um, and they do communally roost in the winter. Um, so it's not that they're social, it's just that they're, 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 their uh, winter needs are different. And so they tend to congregate in similar habitat. Um, very nocturnal. Um, they can have a, ma a, a, a maximum of 10 eggs. Um, and uh, they do like to roost in like, uh, dense evergreen. Uh, again, that nervousness probably wants them to have really deep cover or dense cover. Um, their breeding is March to May. Um, they use stick nests most often um, and sometimes they cohabitat with uh, Cooper's hawks. Um, they uh, small prey specialist uh, looking at their size and they hunt on the wing and they can hover. And then we have our little saw wet. Um, so our northern sawwet is a very small species. It's actually our smallest species of, uh, 
of OWL in Ontario. Um, here's their little territorial call. They may also use this for calling inmates. You can see that there's two images on the left hand side and they look completely different. This is actually um, a, a juvenile plumage on the top and an adult plumage on the bottom. Um, the, uh, the boreal owl and the sawwet have a juvenile phase um, that looks uh, quite different than their adult phase. And that plumage change actually happens rather quickly. So their first set, once they fledge, they look like these cute little chocolate caramels. Um, and then by the time uh, uh, fall hits, they actually look like adults. And the, uh, the food, the saw wet name actually comes from the sound that they make when we hear them food bag. And it sounds like you're sharpening a saw, like wetting a saw. And that's the sound that they make. So um, they're very nocturnal, they're migratory. So sometimes, again, if you see them during the day, it's because they're roosting. And if you disturb them, yes, they will become active, um, but they prefer a nocturnal movement. Um, they're very migratory. Um, so they also are very prolific, so they can have up to seven eggs, um, but they're seasonally monogamous. And so being migratory, it might be hard to match up the same partner. Um, year after year. So the smallest owl, the forested habitat, they'd like to kind of be mid canopy. They don't really go really up high in the trees. Uh, their breeding's March to July. Um, one of the things we're noticing um, with the breeding population that we have in Ontario, it used to be um, north of Toronto that you'd have your breeding occurring. But um, as uh, years have gone on, we actually are now seeing more evidence of them actually breeding in more of the central southern areas. Um, so uh, again, uh, they're adapting, they're changing. Um, they prefer nest cavities and they're small prey specialists. Um, these little saw wets can actually take a bird, uh, you know, um, either uh, the same size as them or a little bit bigger. Um, so they're, even though they're small, they do have that, what I term the chihuahua complex. So they can be ferocious little predators and they hunt from perch. Um, and they're, again, I have migratory twice. Oh, I gotta fix these slides. Um, so now we go to the short-eared owl. Um, the short-eared owl is actually a species of concern. Um, so their habitat types are reducing dramatically. Um, and so they've listed them as a species to watch for. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of um, funds going into researching. Uh, we used to actually have a uh, species at risk biologist uh, linked to the government that no longer uh, is, is a, a position with the government. Um, so we're relying on people and sightings and uh, notifying people of um, like organizations like eBirds. Um, there might be some, even some other organizations um, that are actually taking in your, your sightings and monitoring their population numbers. Um, so territorial vocalization. It sounds like they're having a party. Yo! A lot of people always ask me, what is your favorite owl? And I try to be very political and like, no, they're all special. But I'm going to say that the short ear, it's just a teeny bit higher than everybody else. Um, the breeding call. So it's a low drumming sound. And what's interesting, they're ground nesters. Um, and so a lot of birds, when they're trying to entice a mate, they go by a potential nest and they vocalize. Um, the snowy owl has a very similar breeding announcement call that's a drumming low frequency sound and they're also ground nesters so I found that was quite interesting that they have similarities. And that again they have a bark just like their cousin the long-eared. So these guys are crepuscular. Um, they actually have a really cool um, mating dance where they actually um, are moving around up in the air and the males actually do this aerial clap sound, um, you know, to- Hi, oh, Nick. Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but do you have a window open in front of your PowerPoint? There's right this there. weird yellow screen that I can't get rid of. I don't know what it is. Is it there? It's not there anymore. Okay. I think we're good. Mm. Nope, looks good. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Okay, so- saying it looks good too. 
Yes. Okay. Excellent. Sorry about that, folks. Um, yeah. So the short eared, my favorite. No, it's like a little bit my favorite, just a little bit. Um, so yeah, so they're ground nesters, they use a scrape, and again, they're lazy. They don't do a lot of maintenance and effort into it. It's like here's a divot, and I'm just gonna like, you know, move some stuff around a little bit and then plot myself down. So um, they prey on small rodents and birds, um, and they hunt in the wing and they will hover over a field and they do communally roost just like the long eared does. So then the barn owl. The barn owl, uh, as I mentioned, is occasional sightings because of that uh, low population number. So about, you know, 500 years ago when we settled into these areas, we all had a warm roost for these barn owls. Um, so they actually are a tropical, more southern species that filtered up into um, the northern regions with civilization because we all had corn cribs, we all had milking cows, we had um, um, horses for plowing and we had a warm place for them to live and tons of mice because of the food storage. Um, and so as we, um, uh, you know, stopped that kind of lifestyle and there's less and less of these farming communities that want to have <laughs> access to birds and have a mouse problem, um, the habitat has decreased, but also too, their open habitat um, um, needs are dwindling just like for the short-eared. Um, so um, that's why they're kind of disappearing into the landscape. Um, but in the southern regions, they do very well. So here's a lovely scream from a barn owl. There's actually a really good curdling scream that they do, but I can never grab it um, when they're doing it because it's alarming. And of course, it's a stressful thing when they're doing that vocalization. Um, so it just sounds like a scream. And when they do have uh, chicks, they actually hiss like snakes. And uh, they actually do look fairly different than uh, the rest of the Strigidae. They, if you look at their skeleton, their, their facial shape's a little different, um, even just the way they triangulate. So owls in the Strigidae, when they triangulate, they use their whole head like this. But for some reason, barn owls do like a metronome. <laughs> they go like this. Um, and they have that beautiful heart-shaped face. They have the chocolate eyes. Um, so there's only two species in Ontario that have that dark eye is the barred owl and the barn owl. Um, and uh, everybody else will have the yellow eyes. So that's a good identifier for you to try to at least narrow down what you're seeing in the wild. Um, so they're mainly nocturnal. Um, they, they are sedentary um, in um, areas like uh, southern states, but in our northern climate, they actually have been proven to be migratory. So we still need more information. It'd be nice to actually do telemetry on these species. Um, they breed February to June, um, but they can actually clutch more than once. Um, and uh, we've even had a breeding pair, um, you know, clutch um, in, in off season. Um, so uh, they can uh, be very prolific. Um, they are cavity nest preferred and they primarily prey on rodents and small vertebrates, and they love to hunt uh, in flight and can hover. And like I said, no ear tufts, heart-shaped face, and those lovely dark eyes. Now our barred owl um, is starting to be a, a common sighting in the southern regions. Um, in central um, Ontario, they've always kind of been established there, especially in the Kawartha areas, uh, like what you call cottage country and stuff. Um, they have the most, I think, famous call when it comes to um, trying to mimic an owl, the who cooks for you um, call is very distinct. And then we have a nesting contact call, just a little reaping. Um, so we have a juvenile on the bottom and an adult on the top. So they're a, a larger owl species, mainly nocturnal. Um, they do uh, um, like to claim a territory and maintain it. Um, and uh, keep a, a bond. Um, they can have up to five eggs. They prefer a mixed forest type. Uh, cavity nest is preferred um, and they can go a little bit up on the scale for, for, for prey to, uh, sizing um, but not too much. They, they will go after rabbits um, you know um, but uh, it's mostly commonly rodents and small birds. Um, they hunt mainly from the perch um, and again no ear tufts and those dark eyes. And then the snowy owls. So we have to list the snowy owls because in the winter, 
Um, they're, uh, they're commonly found in the southern region. Um, there are certain times a year where they'll be more popular than other years. And so when you do see a lot more coming down, they consider that uh, what they call an er eruption. Um, they're large owl. They have a variety of activity levels. Um, just because that when they're coming into the, the southern regions, it's because of prey competition. So that you'll see them active in, in several parts of the day, but they do prefer to be nocturnal. Um, so the majority of their activity will be in the evening. Um, but um, um, when they're coming down here, they're coming from, from not, they're not starving. They're just coming for the, comp like the competition's too high up in the tundra. So they get filtered down. So it's usually the juveniles that come first. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of what a juvenile looks like versus an adult. So these two pictures that you see are adult. Um, the one above is a female and the one below is a male. Um, so they have what we consider nomadic movements. They're not really true migrants because it's not consistently done. And it's not, and the movement isn't uh, in a specific um, pattern. Um, it's not always down south. It might be across, it might be diagonal, um, but it tends to be more of a southern movement, but it could be down and across and it's not a very specific route. Um, they like to prefer open habitat. Um, they are breeding uh, May to June up in the tundra and they can have up to 11 eggs. Um, so they're very, very prolific. Um, and again, a ground nester, like we had mentioned with the short-eared. Um, they uh, prey on a, a variety of uh, items and of course, medium size, because they are a bird, they can handle it. Um, and they hunt from the wing or from a perch. So here's a, a, an image um, so that you can try to sex these birds, but it's not concrete, but this is a, uh, a known um, trend um, and you got to get familiar with that thickness. Um, so when we talk about um, the, um, the males and female different plumages, you can see that the females, so on the right side you have females, um, their barring is thicker. So you can like it to like a sharpie chisel marker versus a fine point marker. Um, and so when you look at their tails as well, um, the tail will have three or more distinct bars. So on the left-hand side, you see the male tail. It has really good solid bars on the first and second bar from the bottom, but then that third line, it's more broken. So that to me would be a male tail. There's times as the female ages, she will lose more and more spots, but she will have, again, that distinct band across. So she may, what you might see on a female tail that's a mature tail, you might see three solid bands and then maybe a fourth, a few little spots getting less and less as you go up. Um, but that's how you can kind of piece them out. And uh, in the owl world, the females tend to be larger. And in this species, they actually are significantly larger by at least 400 grams on average. Um, um, they can be heavier uh, for the females. So now we get to how I'm being owl friendly. Um, so one of the things that we like to remind our friends is that uh, it's great that we're all recycling and stuff and that we like to compost, um, but on the roadsides, don't even throw your apple cords out there. So yes, it can turn back into earth and it's not termed really littering, um, but what can happen is that it attracts um, animals to the roadside to nibble on your apple cores and your banana peels. Uh, and therefore, then you'll have more predominantly predators looking for that lovely food source that you've attracted to those sites. So it's best to just hold on to your compostable garbage until you get home. Um, do not feed wildlife. Um, we want to keep them tame and wild. And we're going to discuss further as to why that's beneficial, especially for predatory animals. Um, and educate. Educate, educate is so important. And share your passion with your, with your friends about nature and how beneficial it is for, especially with COVID. Oh my God, COVID. Like, Getting outside, taking a walk, taking a breath um, is so beneficial for your mental health. Um, building nesting opportunities um, in the form of artificial roost boxes or baskets is helpful because um, sometimes what happens, especially with our cavity nesters, um, they rely on mature forests that have maybe lost a limb or, uh, you know, because it's nicely bug infested, it's easier for these, uh, you know, woodpeckers to drill in there and create their own cavities. Uh, mature uh, um, new trees are a little more challenging to build those cavities inside. So, um, you know, the fact that we have less and less mature trees like that, adding an artificial roost boxes is handy. Oops. Um, plant wildflowers and plant trees, of course. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, what projects are in your community is great. 
Um, and then if you are going to view birds, keep viewing to a minimum. And, and um, so we're going to get a little more serious with um, our etiquettes. So again, with COVID, a lot of people are going out birding, uh, may have a fascination with owls and want to join an owl prowl. Um, so here's just some tips um, to make sure that you're doing it ethically and appropriately. So of course, you never trespass on private property. Um, uh, and so uh, you also want to also look at legislation in your area because there's some areas that are protected from trespassing as well as harassing wildlife. Um, and be familiar with your species um, because sometimes if you are viewing an animal and you cause them to direct their gaze to you, you might, might actually cause a predation event because he's now focused on you because you are a predator and it may not notice that there's like a hawk coming. And, um, you know, so you want to make sure that when you're viewing your environment and you're disrupting wildlife, that you're looking all around you to make sure um, you're not uh, creating a bad situation for that species. Um, and recognizing sinus of stress. I can't count how many people say, oh, look, he's sleeping during the day. <laughs> it's like, well, no, like he's laying low, but he's got his eyes slitted and he's got his eye on you and he's making sure that you're not coming in closer. Um, and again, if you interrupt an owl's behavior, um, it's actually causing energy loss. So um, again, I saw it, oh, that's beautiful. Now leave him alone. Um, so anytime you're disrupting it, it's, it's the lost opportunity for hunting, it's the lost opportunity for staying warm. Sometimes if they release that lovely air pocket, especially in the winter, you'll see birds fluff up like this, like with their feathers extended. They've created an air pocket and it's almost like a nice little insulated jacket. So the moment they have to disrupt that, they have to start all over again. And so then they're now using energy to try to reinstate that in a lovely homeothermic little pocket they had. And so they're going to waste energy in trying to recreate that warmth. Um, so never force an action, never startle, never pursue, never, you know, never prevent escape. Um, and if you're going to visit a known roost site, keep it minimum, keep it brief. If it's on your property, then make a blind, you know, create, like, especially during the spring, you know, plant some pea plants, put a little, um, uh, lattice work so it grows so that you can spot them without being disruptive. Um, if you're using vocalizations, again, um, let them call back once leave it alone. Um, the more you're engaging them, the more they're using their, their energy to produce a behavior like a sound, it's wasted energy. Um, they want to use that sound to deter a, another uh, owl species, not necessarily you. So again, you're wasting energy on, on yourself when you're not really a threat, but they don't know that. Um, and then of course, nesting birds. Be very careful because they won't behave, they could get aggressive, but also too, you might delay food delivery by the mail if you're present. They can become aggressive. Um, and of course, never if come between an offspring and a parent. So then, I know we're getting more serious. <laughs> um, so again, don't be fooled. If they are looking at you, then they are concerned about you. Um, if they turn their gaze away, then maybe you are far enough away um, but it also could be that they're just scouting to see if there is any other danger nearby. So then, owl photography. Um, so again, like, you know, keep your photography brief. Um, make sure that you're always, you know, watching behavior. Make sure you're not disrupting. Don't put them at risk. If it's something like, you know, you have a situation where you create a blind, perfect. Or you have a portable blind, use a telephoto lens. Um, and never mob. Um, you know, uh, these are really bad situations for wildlife. And then again, never bait or lure owls. And we'll discuss some reasons. We're going to try to be, I know we're a little over time. We're going to go through these really quickly. Um, introduction of uh, non-native species, um, not a good thing. They don't always get taken out. They could have diseases that affect the wild population. Um, it's not natural. Um, if it's done by roadsides, it creates unsafe situations. Sorry about the image. Um, it reduces fear of humans. Um, and not all of us humans are nice. Um, also too, it, it could create a, a nuisance animal and that animal then may be harmed. Um, so not a good situation for them. Gives them a false sense of success in a territory. So a lot of their movements, a lot of their decisions to breed are based on food density. If you've temporarily augmented the food density for that area, it gives them a false sense that, oh, this is a great place to nest and they end up having a good production year. And then by the time that their babies are born are hatched, um, then it might reflect the true nature of that space and it's not adequate. 
um, it doesn't challenge them. It, uh, you know, they always need to be a fit, fitness ready. And if you're baiting for you know, even a temporary reason, it, 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 it kind of makes them work less hard and it gives them, uh, you know, it doesn't challenge them as well. And then uh, may put them in direct competition with other predators when they're hunting outside of their normal hunting range. And in some municipalities, it's actually illegal. So you can always check with your bylaws. And so if you do have a situation where you're concerned about, you can actually report it. And if it's an infraction of your bylaw, they can get a uh, fine. And don't ask me which ones, because I used to have a list. I think Niagara region does have a bylaw. And I mean, Niagara Falls. Um, but I mean, you guys can communicate with each other which ones you do know, um, which are illegal. And just a little brief thing. Um, if you find an injured animal, please contact um, your local um, people. Um, this is just a few things that they look for um, and wait for instructions because um, you may do more harm than good. You also may harm yourself, especially if you're by a roadside. We actually just had a, a poor red-tailed hawk picked up off the 403. So we notified uh, the local Humane Society, which uh, asked for assistance of the OPP. So anytime it's a highway, a busy road, contact OPP, say there is a wildlife situation on the road that could cause traffic issues and they will respond because they don't want anybody injuring themselves trying to do a rescue if they're not skilled. Um, and again, remember the animal's very frightened, get advice. Um, and baby animals, a little brief uh, statement on that. If a baby falls out of the nest and it's not injured, you can actually put it back. It doesn't go by smell, it goes by where they put it. Um, so you can safely put it back, um, but it's always good to talk to a rehabber just to make sure you are doing the right things. Um, they can guide you through some of the things, or you can take a photo of the animal to make sure that um, it looks healthy and it's okay. Um, but we can definitely guide you through that. But uh, if it's just a bird learning to fly, we can also help you with that. So if it has some wing feathers and it's doing little short bursts and it looks like a little juvenile, just stand back and observe, keep your pets inside, make sure it's safe from traffic. Um, but just watch it learn. It takes only a couple of days for them to get a more adept at it, where they're at least going from branch to branch. Um, but uh, it may not need rescuing, so don't uh, don't kidnap the babies. Okay. So now this is all done. So now I'm going to put my video back on. Where's my video? Uh, I don't, oh, I think Nikki has to do that because you took it off for me, didn't you? Um, I don't think I did, but I'll I see. Didn't do it. <laughs> oh, I, I did, you just have to click start video at the bottom. Oh, there we go, I see it, it finally, it finally went. Okay, so now, oh, I've got sunlight in my vision. Okay, so I was gonna quickly show you a pellet in person, so I'm just gonna quickly do that. I'm gonna put my gloves on, I'm gonna try to, the pictures don't do it justice and then we'll get to the questions so i don't know if you can see that so that's what a pellet looks like so this is a horned owl pellet and so when you break it apart this is where you find all the goodies of course it's very old and brittle so i'm going to see what i can find Oh, there's a leg bone. So there's a leg bone in there. So what's really cool about that, I'm making a big mess on my laptop. I'll have to clean it. Um, is that, like I said, scientists can actually identify, especially on the skull bones. I was trying to find a skull bone. Um, they can actually identify which uh, species it is based on their structures of their, of their skull. And of course, this one doesn't seem to have a skull. It was a, it was a bum, bum one. I got lots of different bones, like a, a little scapula of a mouse. So it's a lot of fun. Okay, so now questions. Let's see if I can answer some of these questions. So I was thinking maybe you could start with the Q&A boxes and then I'll try to look through the chat to see if I can identify, but there was a lot going on in the chat. Yes, there was a lot going on in the chat. So. Aren't burrowing owls omnivores? Omnivore means that they eat plant material. Um, so they do not eat plant material, but they do eat a lot of insects. 
um, and rodents. Um, so um, that answers that question. And do gray horned owls and red-tailed hawks sometimes share a nest? No, not that I've known of. Like, again, we can only base it on anecdotal or scientific evidence. And so there has been never a report of a shared nest situation between a red tail and a horned owl. Um, sometimes what happens is that the horned owl will take it first and red tails have a later season um, than the horned owls. Um, so sometimes what you'll get is if the timing is right, you'll have the horned owl come in first, the, the kids will fledge and then a, a red tail hawk will come in and use their old nest. But most times a red tail makes a new nest almost every year. Um, so, uh, but sometimes if, if it's still available, they may take over. Okay. Uh, where was the bottom picture taken? It looks like milkweed. I don't know which picture that is. Um, barn owl population estimates. Um, again, because there isn't a uh, species at risk biologist um, kind of with the government, we have to rely on the eBird sightings. And I didn't actually look to see wh what the numbers were. One thing I appreciate about eBirds is what they do is they don't post the sightings right away because they don't want um, uh, mobbing happening to especially the rare species. So there'll actually be a three month, I think it's like a two or three month delay from a sighting to a post. And again, with the rare species, they usually want uh, photo documentation um, to confirm that it is actually the species that they're, they're, they're really concerned about. Um, when did you say the owl is ground nesters that mean right on the ground at the base of the tree? Okay, so any of the ground nesters is more of an open field, open habitat. So um, for the tundra birds, like the snowy owl, um, they're, sometimes they'll use like a, 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 a knoll, like a small knoll, just a vantage point. For the short eards, it's usually in like a field, a grassy field. And sometimes actually, it's actually a risk to them because if it's like, say, a hay field, when it comes time to cutting the hay, then the timing can be wrong and it actually can have, uh, you know, an incident with the, with the mowers. Uh, for the fledglings. And the, the sad thing is these fledglings, they go to ground and hide in the ground, which is uh, a riskier situation if it's a, a situation like uh, mowing uh, a hay field. Um, the scrape is a nest. It's just a divot. Um, yes, do not post animal location on social media. Again, we talked about that with eBirds. Um, there's always a delay in where they put it. Um, and so social media is really good. Like a lot of these, um, especially Facebook, there's a couple of sites. What they do is that only like only mis municipality and the municipality of it's here um, just so that you can share where you're doing it, but not necessarily the location. Um, um, there's actually, um, I'm trying to think what books. I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, okay, so when you're talking about looking at posture um, for stressed out birds, um, so tend to, when a bird is roosting, they tend to be skinny and camouflaged and blend in. So the first posture that they do is a really straight, elongated, skinny posture. And if that's not working and their camouflage is not working, what they'll then do is actually fluff up and make themselves look bigger. Uh, and that's when you might actually hear a beak clacking uh, sound and it's just their upper and lower mandible coming together and they make like almost like a snapping sound like that. Um, and then the next would be if it doesn't work, they may actually even make themselves look even bigger and expand their wings out or uh, fly away. Um, but the first step is like, I'm skinny, I'm blending, you can't see me. And then the moment they start fluffing, then that is I'm bigger, go away. Um, I have a screech owl box that we had screech owls come for a week a month ago. They have not come back and we had to evict squirrels every week. Uh, we use stick and bang the house. Do the squirrels chase the screech owls away? Will a dog in the yard scare them away? Did not seem concerned the week before. Um, so one of the things that you can do if you do have squirrels going into your boxes is actually just to put up a second box a little higher. Uh, and a little further. So you might end up in a situation where the, the, the squirrels will take over that box and then the um, screech owl will take another. They actually had that situation with duck boxes. They were trying to encourage duck, ducks to go in the duck boxes, uh, the wood ducks. Um, and so they ended up, uh, a few people ended up having actually have two boxes, one for hopefully the screech owl, one hopefully for the duck. Um, so that might be an option. Um, 
Hi, Nick. Yes. I think people want to see you more. Is it possible to stop sharing your screen? Because there you are like this tiny little box right now because your screen is oh, so big. Oh, because I'm really small. Okay, so how do I do that? Can I X a screen? Oh, wait, there should be a stop share. Stop share. Yeah. There we go. There go. So then you didn't see my pellet then. Well, not as well as we could have, I guess. Yeah, it's not a very good pellet, anyways. Like I said, like I had like one little, one little leg bone. I was hoping for a skull, but it didn't quite work out the way I hoped. And that's the thing—you never know what you're gonna get. It's like a box of chocolates, right? It could be a really cool pellet, like in uh, in spring um often with screech owls that come in we actually get june bug pellets and so it actually doesn't hold very well because there's no fur to mat it together it's just a whole bunch of little legs and wings um those are really really cool and again i have the sun in my face um and so okay going back to the questions i might yeah, just, hang on. Let's try it. okay um Oh, thank you. Somebody just said excellent. Um, beyond the borders of Ontario, the burnout historical wage, the population stable level or considered at risk. It's still considered at risk. Actually, at one point, they actually listed them as extirpated in Canada. Um, now they're just listed as endangered. Um, so again, birds are adaptable. Um, if they have, um, uh, you know, abilities to adapt or find footholds, um, because competition with other birds of, uh, of prey is a concern. Um, but again, like the more her habitat we can preserve, um, the more we can be aware, the more we can, you know, um, help out with uh, roost sites. Uh, um, again, like they're like, we do like I've seen barn owls in the wild, um, not very frequently. Um, but they do, they're still in the landscape. It's just that they're so, the population is so small. It, the sightings are pretty rare. I believe there was a sighting, uh, I think Burlington, um, there was an image taken and it was confirmed that it was a barn owl. So, so they do, they, they there are in the area. So hopefully they can get, get a foothold. But again, in the Southern regions in the United States, um, they're abundant. They're one of the more common species that are actually brought into, um, rehabilitation in New Jersey. Um, and that's not very far away. So, um, so it's not a species that is uh, critically endangered um, for a global uh, standpoint, like the burring owl and the spotted owl. Um, but um, it's still uh, something that we just want to maintain here in Canada. Uh, would any bigger owl take pets, cats or small dogs? That's a good question. Um, so especially during the nesting season or when prey density is tight, um, it's not typically part of their menu. So one of the things I like to share with people is that when owls are raised by their parents, they have a food menu that's delivered to them. When they become independent, they look at that food menu and they try to replicate it. So they watch their parents hunt specific items um, and, and they go for that as their first choices. If they are desperate, they are hungry, and it looks like something that they might potentially be able to match up with a previous image, like say a rabbit, they had rabbit as part of their diet, but they would look for a rabbit. But if food is really scarce and they can't find a rabbit and there's this really cute, small, fuzzy dog or a really small cat, they might go, well, it doesn't look like a rabbit, but it's close enough, I'm going to make an attempt. They don't, any predator don't want to risk an injury. They'd rather go with something that they know their defense mechanisms. And so they want to prefer to go for those items. But if they are hungry, they will risk injury to attempt to catch something. So it's not part of their regular menu, but it is still a potential. So if you do have a small cat, well, we, we, we're proponents of keeping cats indoors. Um, my cat's leash trained. She's an indoor cat, but she gets to go out on her leash. Um, it's just better for your cat and for wildlife. You know, your cat can get into so many dangerous situations. Your neighbor doesn't appreciate the poop in their gardens. But also, too, like they can get into, uh, even if your cat's fixed, there's communicable diseases they can get from the feral population. Um, so there's just too many risks. So why do that? And then when it comes to your small dogs, um, uh, you know, like they, some of them do look like pretty small little rabbits. Um, so just make sure you're with your dog. Don't let them out late at night. Uh, unattended, you know, some people have fence yards and they trust that everything's going to be okay. 
um, it may not be the case. So it's just always be better to be cautious, especially during the nesting season. Okay, so that was a question for early in June. Oh, yeah, so rodenticides um, are a concern. Um, so we always encourage actually to use kill traps. Never use glue traps either. Um, they, they, they tote them as humane, but it's actually quite inhumane because they're actually stuck. And sometimes if you don't take them off carefully, they can actually have their skin uh, peel away. Um, so, and also it, it may target other animals. So um, we always recommend the, you know, it's not as pleasant for the person using them, um, but we believe in the kill traps versus any kind of poison or glue trapping. Um, and of course, you know, like, look at your property and look at how you can curb them coming into your home. Um, so um, rodenticide tests, we base it on um, what our um, um, examination tells us, um, but there was a study done uh, recently with any of the necropsies that we sent to the Canadian uh, Wildlife Health Center. Um, so they did do a study. And so there is uh, low levels in most birds. Uh, and then there's some that actually have peak levels um, that could be a concern for their health. Um, but we always are a proponent of using kill traps instead of um, rodenticides. Volunteer opportunities for many organizations right now because of COVID <laughs> are pretty minimal. Um, we do have um, a, a volunteer driver program. Uh, and so if you wanna join that, so how that works is that if there's an owl that's found in your area or a bird of prey that needs a lift, um, they, um, then we, you might be contacted. So we have uh, several people on the list, which is really important because we can't expect that at the last minute, somebody is going to be available in that area. So it's nice to have at least 10 or 20 people in a specific area that we can say, you know, just go down the list and say, okay, based on what they wrote on their form, they're available, you know, Saturday afternoons versus Tuesday afternoons. We'll try them first. Oh, oh they were busy, we'll go to the next person. So um, I believe on our Facebook page, you can message us and ask for a form and you can fill that out. Um, so predators, um, other birds of prey. So um, any small owls, they can get taken by larger owls. Um, long ears sometimes will take uh, out um, little sawets. Um, and um, actually there was a really cool image that somebody shared on Facebook of a great horned owl knocking a bald eagle off its perch. So, so, there's competition and they may not be like direct predation events um, where they're trying to actually target and eat. It might be a defense system, like to say like, I don't want you in my area, you might keep my kids. Um, but there is actual predation as well, where you actually have a consumption. So um, you, could, you could have a great horned owl consuming a bird owl. And again, it's survival of the fittest. Um, most predators target, you know, by surprise or by looking for weaknesses. Um, and so one of the things I like to share with people is that predators are an important part of the health of a population. They usually tend to take out the slower, the less aware, you know, so that the ones that are left are the ones that are faster, quicker, <laughs> healthier. And those are the ones that are part of the next breeding population. So if you look at it that way, then you might uh, have more respect for these predators and they all work in con conjunction with each other. Um, so it's, you know, like the circle of life, just like the Lion King. <laughs> so, um, um, let's see. Um, I think we've narrowed down the questions on the question and answer. So Nikki, is there anything from the chat groups that needed addressing? I think a lot of people were able to ask the questions in the Q&A, even if they had okay. asked them in the chat as well. There okay, was one, okay. Yeah, there was one clarification. Um, and if I'm wrong about that, guys, just put them in the chat uh, right now and I should be able to see them. There's a clarification about, let's see, let me use a little bit ahead. So um about snowy owls being okay. native um so i think you said that they're not native to the uh arctic they are like that like arctic pole i'm talking about like the very very top of the pole they don't live there they live in the tundra which is below the arctic pole okay yeah i think that was just the clarification some yeah. people thought you're saying that they're not native at all to that area yeah um, so, so when you look at your globe you have the arctic pole up here then the tundra comes down so they're in the tundra area so there's no animals that live on our arctic pole like in the owl world it's just in that lower range of tundra but you never know with climate change 
you may then get more movement of prey species that therefore they follow the prey species, right? So predators follow prey. So if we lose our, our Arctic ice uh, to a point where you get an established prey density right at the Arctic pole, you'll have them move up, right? So um, they're very, most populations are driven by food source, mating opportunities and territory. So wherever they can find it, they'll move and fluctuate and model themselves to that. Great, I think, I think that was everything you're... Yeah, the, a good point um, from Pat. Yes, Northern Harrier Hawks and, um, and Shorted Owls uh, use the same habitat and because they prefer a, a different timing, um, they actually cohabitate really well. Okay, so you're just getting lots of thank yous. Oh, that's so nice. And sorry about the mix up with the, the screen. And then, like I said, I made that boo boo on that one slide with the family versus genus. Um, trying to get a little more science in people um, to try to, uh, you know, get a little scientific with the fun layman stuff. Um, but uh, thank you so much for learning about owls. And if you have any questions, um, feel free um, to use the messenger on Facebook. Uh, timing wise, we're of course going to prioritize our owls in our care versus a question that might be able to give us a little bit more leeway in time. Um, and if you do want to become a volunteer driver, just send us a note and we'll send you the form. And like I said, sometimes you'll get called right away. Sometimes it might be a couple months. It depends on what our needs are and when you said your availability was. And yes, you're just driving a box. You very rarely get to see the animal, <laughs> but some people are happy just to help. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I just wanted to let everyone know, you know, if you ever want to learn more um, or have more volunteer opportunities across the moraine, either you're learning about owls or other species that are local to your neighborhood, um, you can always join our newsletter and you might be able to see Nick again one day. Who knows? Um, yeah. Hopefully in, in person at some point in the future. Oh, yes. You know, I think everybody's anxious to start seeing people in person, but it's great that the full country has taken this seriously and hopefully our, our vulnerable people are you know kept safe and um you know just it's around the corner I can feel it just everybody just hang in there hang in tight and we'll get there absolutely and Is if you, you ever know, need all um, masks you know <laughs> totally we have there, Macy, mine? mine's owls <laughs> of course so uh yeah so have fun with it while you're here and uh you know Hopefully you learned a little bit and feel free to learn more. All Lots right. to learn. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who spent the afternoon with us. Uh, hopefully we uh, hear from you or see you via video or see you at one of our events soon. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.